Okay, so I look to high frequency solution, and so I will have a semi classical parameter, and I look to systems, yeah? And uh, in fact, it's a joint work with uh, Caroline Lasser and Didier Robert. So she's in Tum, and Robert, Didier Robert, who is in Nantes. Okay, so um, in fact, it's, it's something which is inspired by the works of theoretical chemists, two theoretical chemists, which are named Hermann and Klug, who proposed in the 80s a manner to compute the wave function, um, which is a solution of um, Schrodinger's equation with matrix valued potential. So you have this is a vector and you have a matrix valued potential. And um, such systems ar arose in chemistry from the bon oppenheimer approximation. And these chemists, they wanted to make computations. So they proposed something what is called the Hermann Krupp propagator to uh, represent the solution of, uh, the so of this equation. So it was a numerical method which has been studied from mathematical point of view uh, by um, Swart, Swart and Roos first. Roos and Swart. In, I think, 2009. So actually, here it's scalar. So the, the thing that we're looking at, Hermann and Kluck, was for V of X uh, scalar. Okay, they were not really looking to systems, they were looking to one equation, okay, and they proposed this method. Their main difficulty was that the X is high dimensional because it's, it represents molecules, so you have molecules, you have several atoms, so, so you have electrons, nuclei, so a large number of, um, of dimensions, X is now D and D is large, so that was the first difficulty they had, and the other one is the oscillatory fixture. So the idea was to, with these two difficulties, numeric, in a numerical manner. And so we introduced their, their Mankrug propagator that I will call, I will explain later what it is for the moment that you'll call it HK of T. Okay, and the pro what proved Roos and Swart for this system and Didier Robert later for, uh, for more general system. So something like H of T of epsilon, f of t, or I use the same uh, notation, something which is, I mean, just a quantization of an Hamiltonian which is time dependent. They prove that the propagator, so let's call it u epsilon of t s, which give a solution of uh, the equation, is approached by this uh, u uh, Hermann Kluck, this pro Hermann Kluck propagator, as a, uh, as a power epsilon for t on an inter a compact interval, let's say zero t. So more or less so what I am saying here is that this is the, the propagator. So it satisfies something like that, U epsilon of t s. And the epsilon of SS equal identity. Okay, so this was more or less the picture. And uh, what we wanted to do is to, 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 ge to generalize the approach to systems. Um, so, what I'm going to do today is first to explain you what is this Sermon Group propagator. Okay, then we will see how to, to deal with systems. Okay, which things are and more precisely what we have looked at with systems with crossings. And here again we will find that the method we propose uh, the analysis we propose is inspired again by by, a chem by two chemists, Julie and Tristan. It's in the eighties too. We are proposing methods for dealing with uh, with crossings. The main difference is that we make proof while they were just 
deriving methods, and which were, I mean, rough, robust enough that it's better to have proof. So, what is the Hermann Kluck propagator? Uh, so, I need a few notations. So, I have my operator. So, you are fine with this H epsilon, or do you need a formula for how to quantize or things like that? No, it's okay. Okay, here, my Hamiltonian would be xi square over two identity to V of x, and then I have this H. So, for the moment here, I just assume that my matrix valued Hamiltonian is scalar. So, it's a function of H of T X Xi, okay, and very often I will call this Z, and Z is in R two D, okay. And um, this is the, the, the first notation, and then I am going to use wave packets. So the first wave packets that I'm going to use are Gaussian wave packets that I write. Uh, so it's normalized L two function. Uh, which are centered at a point Q and oscillating along the direction P. Okay, so the Z here is refers to QP. Okay, this is uh, it's, it's normalized. Okay, and um, it's a wave packet in the sense that uh, I have a kind of a sort of profile which is uh, the function G naught. Y equal pi minus d over four f square two. Okay, and I am I have a sort of process for cooking something oscillating just by adding uh, I mean like adding a concentration on the point Q and an oscillation. And this process, I could do that for any uh, Schwartz function. Okay, so in fact, what I have written here, if I play it with my notation, is that this uh, this this uh, Gaussian this wave packet in uh, Z, the Gaussian wave packet in Z, is just the wave packet constructed in Z with my uh, normalized Gaussian G zero, just to play with the notation. Okay. And um, and uh, the last notation I will need use is something that I want to have some variance in my uh, my Gaussian, so I'm going to let them brief. In sense. So I take a matrix gamma which is symmetric, and with uh, an imaginary part which is non-negative. Okay, and I denote by G gamma epsilon. Z, the wave packet in Z constructed with uh, the function G gamma and G gamma of Y is uh, up to a normalization factor, something like that. So I gamma Y dot Y. Okay, so the imaginary part of gamma is, uh, is non-negative, so this is the Schwartz function. Okay. Uh, the only thing is that, okay, he also has some imaginary, there is a phasis inside, which is uh, related with a uh, real part of gamma, that's life. Huh? Okay, and it means that with this notation, what I have called G0 is nothing but G0 of I, G I identity. Okay, here uh, the standard choice is to take uh, gamma equal I identity. Okay, so this is just notation. And uh, the Fouquet okay, idea of uh, Hermann and Kluge, I mean, it's something that uh, is to use what people call the, the Gaussian frame when you do wavelets, okay? And when you do macro analysis, you call this the Bargman transform. Okay, and the point is that if you consider a function f which is in L2, you associate to it its Barman transform, which is a function on Z, that you construct just by taking Y epsilon minus D over 2, the scalar pro product against the Gaussian. 
Okay, and this gives you a frame because if you check carefully, f of x is nothing but the integral of these functions again g epsilon of z is f. Okay, so z is in R to D, it's my QP. Okay, I look to the mass of f against this uh, Gaussian, and then I integrate. Okay, so it gives new, you a nice formula. And of course, I mean, I mean, of course, or not of course, but the idea of Fermat and Kluck and to say, okay, I put it u epsilon of ts, okay, then you arrives there. This is a graph packet, so this is something which is very microlocalized. So it's doable to describe the evolution of that, this thing. And then I will sum up all the contributions and just, okay, so first thing was to say, what can we say about this thing? Okay, and then you define a new uh, formula for uh, numerical applications. So what is the idea behind for numerical applications? Is to say that actually a function, the function that you are going to consider are functions that you can write as a finite sum or you can write or approximate correctly as a finite sum of uh, Gaussian points. And then, of course, yeah, two, yeah, sorry, two, TS. S is my initial time and T is my observation time. And so their idea is to say, okay, if I am able to describe these things, the evolution of a Gaussian wave packet, then I will replace my function by a sum of Gaussian, okay? And this is reasonable because there is this formula. Okay, which tells you that, okay, you are contribution to this, uh, to this function, and then you will, uh, you will let evolve, and I'm going to write it, but just now I wanted to erase something. Yeah, so what can be said about the evolution of a Gaussian? And this is the, the moment where uh, the thing which is, uh, which is cool is that if you look to the evolution of a Gaussian, at a leading order term, it remains a Gaussian, up to some phases. Well, that is there. You have a new uh, Gaussian state with a new, uh, briefing. I mean, it has briefed, so there is a gamma now. And it has moved along a trajectory. Okay, and these phi t are just the classical trajectories associated with the. Uh, Hamiltonian H. Okay, so if I t satisfies the equation, sorry, so this is, yeah, the T S Z T S Z T S Z, thank you. Everything is depending on my initial time. So this I will make some place here just to have all the information there. Okay, and the phi t is, uh, so this is an equality in L2. Okay, and the phi t satisfies the system at t over dt phi t s uh, of z equal so I write it like that, I will explain the notation of T I T S of Z when G is a matrix zero identity minus identity zero. So Z is a function of X and Psi, so it's a function of 2D variables, okay? This is a matrix with D variable here, D, so 2D by 2D, it applies to the, to the, to the, uh, differential of H, and what I obtain is just the classical flow if I have uh, an Hamiltonian which is arising from the Schrodinger operator, for example. Okay, and I have said that this is my initial data, time T is my, let's say, the time, uh, the starting time, so phi SS of Z equals Z. So this is the classical flow. 
Okay. S is the action associated with the classical flow. So Tsz, it's the integral from S to T of uh, P dot P Q dot minus H of T uh, function of the sigma I uh, e sigma where I have set I T S equal E or phi sigma S equal to P. Okay, so you could, just a quantity, it's a classical action in terms of metanexy, which is associated with the trajectory. And for the gamma, you have a formula. Now the gamma are given by a formula, which depends on the, on the matrix associated with the differential of the flow. So if I differentiate the flow, I obtain, uh, I obtain a f uh, 2D by 2D matrix that I write by blocks. A, B, E, D. So all of them are function of T, S, and Z. Okay. And there is a formula for the gamma. The gamma. So I have to write two loops at it because yeah. So the gamma of T S Z is just obtained by taking C plus D. Um, oh. It's a gamma naught A plus B gamma naught minus one, and gamma naught is my initial uh, variance, the initial variance of my Gaussian state. So here it's I identity. Okay, so this so there is something which is not completely obvious at first sight is that this gamma is still a matrix with an uh, non. Uh, non uh, non-negative uh, imaginary part, okay? But it turns out that it is, okay? And this sort of description has been performed in the 80s by George Agadorn on a Gaussian wave packet. And then there are work from Fombescure and Robert, who generalized the approach for Gaussian wave packet to this one, okay? Authorizing the phi to be any function. Yeah. Uh, you mean to, to propagate? Yes, well, more or less. I mean, yeah, 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 because of the Gaussian and so on. Yeah, exactly. So this is the, 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 the ID. So what I wanted to say is the 90s, I think there are people I don't to look for. Uh, yeah, 97. Okay, but this is the picture. So it means that, in fact, what the chemists look at is two, what they call frozen approximation. And uh, yeah, what is? The ah, yeah, on H, you, you need to have assumptions so that you have a solution. And um, more or less, the assumptions are. Uh, uh, but H is subquadratic sub with subquadratic growth, meaning that dz alpha H of Tz is bounded uh, by a constant as long as soon as alpha is greater than two. Okay, and for all T in some interval where you are going to to work and Z in into D. More or less, this is the framework and the, in the matrix value case. Okay. okay, so you see this one is inside, P square plus P of X. Yeah. V? V has to be uh, subquadratic. But the Z is in the uh, X. Yeah. Okay, okay so. What I was saying now was that with, in, 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 with uh, this idea of saying, okay, I know how the, Gaussian, the wave packets behave, then what the, the schemists were using was two kind of approximation. So the Gaussian approximation, which consists just uh, by replacing, uh, so here, you replace your J, C, and Z by this J gamma. 
epsilon phi t of z. So I call it th of t uh, f uh, 2 pi epsilon minus d to integrate over all the set of phase space the scalar product of f which is epsilon z and then you put here the briefing Gaussian so t s z epsilon i t s z and you add uh, the uh, the uh, action okay so this if we take the x i have to put it here okay and uh, the other one, which was really the idea of uh, Hermann and Kluck, was to say that they doesn't want to have these questions that change. They would like to have exactly the same uh, standard one. They authorize the center to move, but they want to stick here. Okay, so you still have the coefficient, and then you have to trade your your uh, your variance by a coefficient. That I will call the Hermann Kluck prefactor. So here you, have, you put a coefficient that I call Hermann Kluck prefactor, and with it, which is also given as a function of uh, of these uh, matrices A, B, C, D. So where is it? It's here. So there is a formula. I mean, when you do numerics, you like to have formula. Two minus d over two, the determinant, the square root of the determinant of a t s z plus d ta -da -da, plus i e minus b. Okay, so good formula. It's a, yeah, that was the formula they were using, and what prove uh, uh, Roussin, Stuart, and Robert, and then Robert is that if I look to the, my propagator, and I compare it, so here I have to tell the argument. If I take the total, the, the total approximation of the frozen one, what I obtain is an approximation of the propagator of order epsilon. Okay? So, first thing that you have to notice is that it's epsilon while here it was square root of epsilon, okay? But the point is that what I, here I have not written all the formula, but what I should have written is that I have a, a complete expansion here. Here I can write the sum over n of wave packet in phi t s of z fn epsilon n over two plus order, so I go to from zero some capital N, and there here I have a, a remainder, which is a last term. And Vf0 is the F gamma that we have, this G gamma that I have written before, okay? So F0 equals this G gamma Esz, okay? But the F1 has some very special structure, in fact. It's, it's related with derivatives or multiplication by y of, uh, of this, uh, this, uh, this g gamma. And because it has this very special feature, you can play in the formula here and do some, uh, some integration by parts, and you gain some epsilon here. Okay, so even though the approximation for a single Gaussian wave packet is in order of square root of epsilon, the approximation, these approximation are of order epsilon. Okay, and so one can imagine how you can prove this. Okay, you pull uh, this, this, uh, this approximation inside, then, okay, you manage to prove the, the total approximation, and to get the frozen, the, 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 the proof that uh, Didier Robert has proposed is to do an evolution argument. Okay, so you are going to connect your G gamma of TSZ with one in front of it by a path that will lead it to this uh, U T S Z G I identity. Okay, and through this you construct by hand some path 
which is of a form, uh, let's call it A, sigma, G, theta of sigma, with so sigma between 0, 1. And when sigma equals 0, you are here. And when sigma equals 1, you are here. Okay, and this allows you to pass from one of the approximations to the other. So this is the, the frozen approximation. And then you link it with a toad approximation just by proving that some operator, for integral operator that you write explicitly, d of x d over d sigma of some operator, there's something which are going to be of that form. So you have this Gaussian. Then you have this A of sigma, and you put uh, D theta of sigma, this big matrix here. Okay, over, okay, so yes, G theta of sigma, epsilon, and phi, and then you have some section, something like that. Okay, and the idea is to prove that this operator, so if when you look to to the d over d sigma of the operator, which maps a function f on, on these things, but this thing is order epsilon in uh, L of L2. Okay, so it's it's a uh, it's big in some sense. It's very, it's technical because you have to, to 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 deal with your big phases, which is complicated and so on. But the idea is quite simple from going from that one to that one. Okay, and then for proving the approximation here. As soon as you have this thing, you just need to, in some sense, two arguments. Okay, you just uh, look uh, to, to here and you think that, okay, you enter the evolution, so you have these terms, a uh, sum of terms, and then there is the remainder. So the remainder, you don't know so much about it here, but you know that it's uh, small in L2, okay? So I look to the L2 norm of this thing, and if I make a very stupid approximation, uh, estimate what I get is some epsilon to a power minus d, then this is bounded, and then I have my remainder, and if I am on a compact set, then this is something like exponential minus d plus n, okay? And the good thing is that whenever you put a wave packet here, then this operator has a very strong structure. And this structure makes that you can estimate it and prove that all of these terms, when I put this series inside here, each term which is provided by the Fn is, is exactly the norm of the form epsilon, epsilon to the power n over two, and the last term is epsilon to the power capital N plus one minus d. So you can just prove the, the estimation in a very straightforward manner, okay? So this was an idea of a proof of this uh, result. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, H is, a sim H is my symbol, it's smooth. Oh, I think we don't need so much to smooth not but at least C1 or C0, but you can take it, I mean, yeah. Sorry? No, uh, here no, because why Why you want to differentiate to D2? Yeah, yeah, but uh, the point is that I don't know, which I never did that. No. Uh, I think the proof, the original proof of Didier Robert is not the thing I have described, because if you want to do that way, you need to, to control more or less the big Z. So you need to, to be sure that when you take the F against some G epsilon Z, these things don't go, okay? But in some sense, since if you have some uh, numerical applications in mind, you are going to work in a box and your face space is a box. So what you are going to assume is that this F times G epsilon Z becomes small when Z is large. And then the argument I have given should work. Work, definitely. They should not be did. Yeah, okay. So what is missing if we want to do systems? Oh. 
Okay, so if I want to do systems, I am going to need vector value the wave packet. Okay, so in fact, since these things are very localized, you see they are really very localized in position and in impulsion. Actually, if I apply a, if I apply a, an operator, I will more or less fix it to Q and P, its value in Q and P. So what we are going to consider is very, uh, I mean, very basic vector valued wave packet just by taking a vector, a fixed vector, V. So V is a vector in Cn, SF. Okay, and then I multiply. This is maybe the canonical basis, yeah? Sorry, yeah? Which T? Yeah, 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 okay. You have to be, uh, it's just bonded, yeah. E, S, and VL2 is global, yeah. I think now, <laughs> it's, it's not a real, yeah, not very nice statement. Okay, so what I'm doing, just taking the canonical basis, for example, so I have a vector and I put, a, 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 what is going to be a wave packet is only, it's scalar component. So this is scalar valued. And then I have, a, okay, and with this, I'm constructing a family of wave packets I can, that I can use, okay? And for my initial data, <coughs> so I'm going to write in the same manner the initial data as a, some, okay, I, I can authorize here to have a vector valued function, so I have a V of Z and I construct uh, up with it and then I take, I put a scalar say, scalar, scalar part. So here I use a little arrow because it's a vector, so Z, V of Z, move with bounded derivatives so that I can define this operator which is pseudo, semi-classical pseudo associated with this thing. So the, here it's the vector valued part and then I have my scalar, uh, scalar component, okay? And uh, okay, so this is just for describing my wave, my, uh, wave function, so psi epsilon zero, okay? And uh, now I'll take my H. So H is now is a matrix, yeah. Yeah, so V, when I put a hat like that, the notation for, yeah, yeah, it's quantized. So I put the quantization in the vector. But you can think just that it's a constant function and you take the canonical basis. I will use this notation. So Z is X psi. X psi. So in fact, I should not put it here, yeah. Didier Robert's notation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that is the point of a phase space. Yeah. So it's QP sometimes, and sometimes it's XI. Yeah. And now my matrix is uh, my, okay. Let's say, let's say that it has two eigen uh, eigen values with eigen vectors. Okay, and uh, the, the, the good, the good, uh, I mean, better case is when, better, I mean, the simpler case is uh, the adiabatic case. Adiabatic, it's mean when the, the eigenvalues H1 and H2, they, they, they are separated, um, I mean, on all the space. So there exists some delta 1, such that for all Tz, in R time R to V. Okay, this why I before. H2 of T Z minus H1. So there is a gap. This is the gap structure case. Okay. When you are in that, in that situation, things are good in some sense because there is, there is, uh, you can, 
diagonalize your operator and you can write your evolution operator as a superposition of two uh, evolution related with uh, this, uh, each of the modes. So I am going to write something and then I will, I will give definition. Okay. Yeah, so here I have said that uh, uh, I put epsilon infinity, meaning that, I, that uh, I can for all, okay, for all n, I can construct two things like that, such that here I have an approximation at order epsilon n plus one. And the good thing is that this is a new, uh, a new Hamiltonian, which starts like with the eigenfunction, and then has some, 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 some term that I call adiabatic, the perturbation, and then plus epsilon square, da, 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 okay, up to n, z, okay. And uh, here, so it's a super adiabatic, uh, it's called super adiabatic eigenvalues. And then you have a super adiabatic eigenprojectors, which starts with a projector. And then you have to, if you have to mod modify them, up to the nth component. Okay, and this is some kind of algebraic way to, con to construct this, uh, these matrices. Of course, if you just take that one, it doesn't work. Okay, you need to have the correctors. And what is new comparatively to what we have done before is that I have something scalar plus a matrix. So this is a matrix. Yeah. Yeah, there is, so my capital H is just, it doesn't depend. I could have put it, uh, could add something, but here it doesn't depend, okay? And then if you want to diagonalize it, you just think to your pseudo differential calculus, you are going to apply the projector, you apply the projector to H, you know this. <laughs> and then, Yes, you put you you write the quantization of epsilon of pi g, of epsilon of h. Okay. The little h. The little h. Nobody here. Nobody is depending on epsilon. This is just the, the symbol. So what you do? Yeah, exactly. So when you look to be h hat, yeah, you gain uh, and you put a remark. You put the projector, then you have the H hat. Oh, okay, so T now because of T pi G. And then you have an epsilon correction term, something. And the idea is to introduce correctors so that so that you, you can eat all the terms and you have this is now it's you, when you apply when you want to describe your 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 solution. You just need to understand these terms. Yeah? And so this is something uh, that is due to, to um, which is maybe in your book, uh, but uh, the reference that I know that are Kuhn and Teufel, uh, where is, when it was, it was 2007 or nine, I don't know, so I remember it perfectly. I look, yeah, 2007. And there is also, this has also been done by Martinez or Donny, uh, 2009, I think, yeah. But there are a lot of ideas who are in all the works of Nancy on the 30s. Okay, so this is something that I think people from my local community was knowing. Uh, so there is an, an some nice algebra to construct all these things. And then at the end, you, you are reduced more or less to a scalar, that's something, thing, okay? 
So it means that more or less that we are going to find uh, in, in our approximation, okay, you, 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 you can start to guess what will be the, 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 uh, the approximation. The only thing to, to add is to deal with the vector, the vector uh, of uh, the vector component, okay? And this is done by parallel transport. So, along the trajectories, we are going to define the parallel transport. So, with my HG, I can associate a flow. So now it's a phi G, T, S, Z actions. Okay, I have a variance along this flow that I can define also. And we are my group uh, refactor, UG, S, Z. Okay, and for the vectors, what you introduce is uh, the, um, the parallel transport that is uh, written as follows. So we introduce matrices, IDT, RG. Z, which are uh, exactly eating this adiabatic refactor S Z R G, okay, and this term was a formula. Okay, I can write this formula before. So it's I don't know if you want the formula for Hg, but the point is that you have some formula, yeah, the adiabatic corrector here is not, has no component on the orthogonal of pi g. I choose a mod, I choose a pi g. Its uh, diagonal component is given just by taking a Poisson bracket of uh, H with, with pi g, okay, this, is, this can not be zero, okay, on some examples. And then you have some uh, mixed components of that form. And here again, you have a formula uh, where it takes to account pi g. So it's something like dth plus hg plus pi g. Okay, so you see the flow is here more or less. So this is the Poisson bracket. So gradient psi, gradient x minus gradient x, gradient psi. Okay, so it's exactly saying that I am differentiating the, this Hg along the flow, and I assume that it's uh, at time s, it's just identity. Okay, so this defines a matrix. And this matrix has an important property. It switch the... It, it follows the, uh, the Eigen mode. Okay, so the nice property. Uh, is... Sorry? This, this one? So this R is the solution of this ODE. Okay, so I'm writing an ODE along the trajectory. So for the moment, I have just said defined let Rg be that thing. I consider this solution. And what, what is the nice property of Rg is that when you apply it to a projector, you remain, uh, if you start from a time s in an eigen mode, you remain inside it, but along the flow. So you arrive in the, spec in the spectral projector associated with the point along the trajectory. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, because more or less H commutes with it. I have not answered your question. Yeah. Uh, so I am, what I am, yeah, Mary, yeah, you can think like that, okay? And uh, maybe I write the, the, the the approximated, the approximated propagator, and we can discuss it. So, what is the result? So, if you, okay, you need to to work a little bit because 
what we said before was not for us, uh, with for us to, was for a scalar Hamiltonian and not for something with plus epsilon. But more or less, if you trust that this thing is playing the, the, the job, what you obtain at the end is a theorem that uh, if I define so the total approximation, so this I apply it to a function, an, an initial data of that form. So I want some initial data, and it has a vector vector part here. So what I am going to compute is the, the scalar product of the scalar part with the Gaussian. Okay. And um, so this is for one mod. So for this mod, I need to project the vector on uh, the mod. So this is a function of z. Okay. And then I apply my operator r, which is letting evolve, taking into account the evolution along the trajectory. And at the end, what I have here is the, the Gaussian with this variance. Uh, so, and I am in integrating and I have forgotten the action. Okay, so you see that the only difference is that you project on a mod and you apply, but it looks like the, the preceding ones. And of course, the toast, the present version would consist in replacing the G gamma G by the Hermann Kluck uh, refactor, and now we take a standard Gaussian. Okay, and the result is that again, if I have uh, yes, if I have T S between uh, in some interval I, which is of finite finite length. Okay, uh, but uh, we have an approximation of u by so we sum from g equal one to two because I have only two mods, but you could imagine to have more mods, and then you have this i g code of frozen. Um, this is smaller than a constant time epsilon. Okay. Minus, yes, sorry. Thank you. Uh, okay, so in fact, this is not really new. You just put the pieces together, uh, the scalar evolution, and the, the main, I mean, the, the cool thing is that one, of course, the adiabatic uh, decomposition, and then you collect your pieces and you have this result. Okay? But this was we under this assumption that we are in the adiabatic case. Okay? And if so I should have put it adiabatic. Okay, and now when things become to become tricky is when there is a crossing, so smooth crossing. And it is the thing in which we have been interested. It's when we have a, a submanifold epsilon where H1 equals H2 is a sub, uh, in an hypersurface. I assume that it's an hypersurface. Okay, and I assume that H1, H2, pi 1, pi 2 are smooth. And then the result is no longer true. Okay, because an example, yeah, we take psi square over 2 plus x1 plus theta of x sine theta of x theta of x minus cos theta of x. Okay. My theta is smooth. And then you have a crossing in x1 equals 0. It's called dimension 1 crossing in chemical literature. I see. You cross, but along, uh, I mean, in one variable, and, if, and along an hypersurface, so dimension 1. And then, yeah? 
It's not a conic. There is no conical intersection. Yeah. There is no singularity. You are very disappointed. <laughs> but that could be next time. Huh? Yeah, yeah, why? Yeah. It's a trace-free matrix. Okay, so you can put any trace-free matrix which without crossing. And if you are if you have a crossing along a kodam an hyper surface, you can factorize the equation, and so you are linked to something like that. So if you Okay, and in that case, so if I am not adiabatic, if I have a smooth crossing. Uh, okay, the statement is false, but just because I have to replace this by square root of epsilon. So at that level, you say, okay, that's fine. But if you think to numerics, square root of epsilon is very bad. Yeah. So you want to, to know what is happening next. And this is the thing for the. Ah, I should stop already. Ah, yeah, thank you. So I have uh, five minutes. Okay. So you want to, to know what is arriving next. What happens? I am at part three. Part three is conclusion. What is the picture? So you have your hyper surface. Yeah, the shock hyper surface. And. Uh, Again, you need to know what happens to a Gaussian wave packet, for example. So you take your wave packets here. Okay, so it's I time S and Z. Okay, and it moves. The, let's say that, I mean, here I am far from Y, so my, my, my more or less, my, uh, it's here, my adiabatic theorem is still is, is true. And if I start with a vector which is on the one mode one, for example, I will move. With the mod one, to say, okay, and I arrive somewhere. I can reach my upper surface at some t flat z flat point, let's say, okay. And for being sure that I can arrive here, I need assumption, and the assumption that I am going to make is that my h one, so h two minus h one is f function f, and h I call h two plus h one over two v. So epsilon is f equals zero. So f is an equation of epsilon. And what I assume is that dcf plus vf is non-zero. Okay. Assuming that, it implies that the trajectories they really pass through the shock hyper surface. Okay, so it continues then. And as you see, if you trust my, my result there, the, more or less, the wave packet is continuing here at uh, its, its main part, order one, but something arises on the other tra of the trajectory for the other mode. So at that point, something arises at, um, which is exactly of size square root of epsilon. Okay? So now, if you turn, think in terms of trajectories, you have a new type of trajectory. You have some sort of, of uh, hopping trajectories. Uh, it's the name that the chemist gives to this trajectory. Okay, you start from one mode, so you evolve with phi t s one of z, and then when you reach epsilon, you open a new trajectory, so you continue with the one, but there is a new one with the phi q t s t t flat of z flat. Okay, and this trajectory, I call it phi 1, 2, e, s of z. Okay, so I have a trajectory which is changing of, uh, of value. Okay, and then you can define all, the, all your favorite, I mean, all the, the objects that we had defined for the the trajectories, the usual trajectories, a smooth one, you can as associate them also to this trajectory. So I can define uh, the action. So I have some action, F, T, S, Z, 1 of 2, which is you start with the action 1, and then you switch to the equation of the action 2, which becomes T, T flat, Z flat. Okay. 
So the action is yeah, okay, more or less. Action. Then you want to define some variants, matrices. So at the beginning you have a gamma one, and then you want a gamma one two. Okay, which will be for for as you have seen maybe the formula is somewhere. No, no longer. The gamma depends was depending on the initial data. When I wrote my result, I put some gamma naught. And so this gamma one, two is constructed with a flow phi two and some initial with a phi two, phi two phi, phi flat, offset flat, and an initial data that is a gamma flat that you have to compute explicitly. So this is a gamma flat of uh, S Z, okay? When I arrive here, there, I have uh, my, my wave packets are brief, so there is a gamma one, and there is a formula for, for writing this gamma flat, uh, which is, uh, you take the gamma one, and then you play a little game with two parameters, alpha, beta, so this is alpha and beta are vector. So this is a vector. I take the tensor product, it gives a matrix. And then below there is the number two mu minus alpha dot beta minus gamma one alpha. Okay. And this alpha beta are the parameters of the cross link. Alpha beta is related with the gradient of the gap. Okay, the gap is zero on epsilon, but the gradient is non-zero. It's by passing through. Okay, and then you find something which is non-zero. Okay, it's better that it's non-zero because I want to play with it. And the value of mu is also a formula related exactly with uh, this, uh, this quantity. Int flat, z flat. So those those parameters are more or less the parameters that are, that are, that are the parameters of the transfer here. Okay? And then I need an over, yeah, okay, I need to say how I move the vectors. So I had these vectors that I, call, I can call V1. Here I had some vectors V1 of T and Z. It arrives, and when it arrives, I need to switch it to to have it on the other mode. So I take the V1, T flat, S, Z. I move it with some matrix W. And then I let it evolve with uh, the flow, this flow two. And this gives the vector V12, T, S, Z. Okay, and this matrix W is related with uh, the, the, der the derivative of the flow at the level of the crossing along the, tra the again with the et plus bracket with p. Okay, and you see that it it is sending something which is on on the first mode is sent on the second mode. Okay, and I stop just by adding my corrector term to get. Uh, Okay, so now I have to can put the square root of epsilon. Okay, and this correction term is constructed exactly. It's better like that. <laughs> okay, and this uh, this correction, uh, I mean this transition term, is constructed with these vectors, these matrices. Uh, I need this flow, okay? And if I have mat the matrices, I have also the Hermann group parameter the prefactor that I can, I can uh, associate with. And it's exactly the only thing that you do is that you add, a, you need a cutoff like T bigger than T of Z inside your integral. And that's it. Sorry, I've been a little bit 